build um, and bridge building, but not necessarily in money. Okay, John, I'm to comment, and then we're going to Mike. Yep. And sorry, John, were you? Yeah, I, 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 I saw yeah, you wanting I, to jump in there. It was, <laughs> so I'm a little confused. Um, so we are essentially saying, if I understand correctly, I'm, I may not understand correctly, that audiences are dwindling. That's number one. Is that true? Am I, in the new creation? I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. that's, that's what I'm sensing. You've said that. Yeah, in a certain sector, I think it is. The, the audience is dwindling too. The audiences are predominantly uh, white, older. W white By white, I mean, I, I would think Anglo. Anglo. Let's just term that <laughs> Anglo. Uh, and older. Uh, is, that, is that correct? And that it's good to have audiences that are not Anglo and older. It's good to have audiences that are not only. And, yes. Mm -hmm. Anglo. And, and, and the question is, how do, you, how do you find these people? How do you attract them to you know, give you their time and money and come into your space? I think that's some of the question, right? I mean, some of the question is, some of the question is not about going out and finding these specific people. Some of the question is about who are the people that are coming and why are they coming? And, and, the and what is the place of, opposite. like for me, it's very much less about who are we selling tickets to than who are our stories of interest to. You know, um, our, uh, for me, it's more if uh, we make our stories relevant and make it clear that they are relevant, people will come because people need that, as opposed to how can I get your ticket price today? That's, I think they're two different thoughts. Y yes. Yeah, yeah. Entirely. Now, now I, I would venture that, you know, life changes all the time, society changes all the time, uh, and what used to be of relevance to audiences 20 years ago is not as relevant anymore. So obviously there, there is a change. As well, people, I mean, even the curriculum of what people are studying, students are studying in high school, has changed. And, uh, you know, there, there isn't as much of a, it, it's, it's all changed, it's all changed. So obviously people don't have even the background to appreciate or even understand or even Get, get to certain stories. Right. So, mm -hmm. so the, and is that the kind of theater we still need to make? We, like, I wanted to get to diplomatic immunities to talk about a different kind of performance. But, but there's a mic up there yeah. and a woman with a mic who wants to ask okay. a question or say something. Um, I actually wanted to bring it back to something that was said earlier in the evening about young audiences and how what happens to them between they go see theater as children and then something happens by the time they hit teenage years where. Oh, is this a movie? Like, what has happened in between there? And I think, um, I think part of it is just when you're a kid, you believe in magic. You believe in the suspension of disbelief because there's, let's go and pretend. It's all about pretending. You believe in Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny. And then you kind of hit 10, 11, 12, and you go, oh, no, Santa Claus is not real. Easter Bunny is not real. And you have technology also brought into your world with the Internet, with iPods, and with movies that are so, to me, the opposite of theater in terms of suspension of disbelief, because it's, look at our new special effects. Doesn't this look real? Doesn't this look amazing? Whereas, to me, the best, some of the best theater I've seen is two actors, two chairs on a stage, and that's it. So, I mean, it's kind of a bit of a rhetorical question, but how do we get kids at a certain age before they hit teenage years to keep believing in magic and wanting to go to the theater to see live people and to pretend again? Or, just if I can tack on a small modification, how can, how can we get them to never lose it or to redevelop it again as adults? Because I still believe, and she still believes, and I think most of, most of these people still believe in magic. I live for magic. That's what I always ask for when I go to the theater. If someone says to me, will you come see my show? I say two things. Is there any kissing? Because that's gross. <laughs> and is there magic? Because I need that. Or I will not come. Okay, but it's it, number one question, though, is there any kissing? It's gross. <laughs> uh, I have a theory about, about young audiences that's not very popular. Uh, in that kids, kids love the theater for exactly the reasons that, that you, you say. It is, it is, it, 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 it's living in their imagination, and, and they love that. And then as they get older, it, it, uh, that, that kind of disappears. And then they get, uh, and I know it's I know it's very popular to try to find young audiences, but I by young audiences I mean audiences in their twenties, and a lot of a lot of some companies have special programs for audiences under thirty, and they charge them a 
a certain amount of money, the understanding that you know people in their 20s are still trying to earn a living, they're, you know, they have other priorities. <laughs> and I, I think that's, that word is the key, is, is, a, is a priority. I think, I don't know, that, and I, the, the, the people in their 20s, I know if you, were to, if you were to say to them, okay, you have so much money, do you want to go to a club and spend it, or you want to go to the theater? Club. They will go to the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Even Frank. They, they, the they, they will go to the club. No, I go ahead. No, I want to. I want to disagree. I, I want to disagree because we we just have never invested a penny in in theater for young audience for for uh, youth. Like if you go if it, you know if you go if you go down to the Princess of Wales, my mom used to love going down to the Royal Alex before the Princess of Wales because she could have dinner, she could park her car, mm -hmm. go up, have dinner, walk out. Go in, see a show, get her car, and drive home. Mm -hmm. That whole setup was designed perfectly for her. Okay. Now, there's a theater in Berlin, and there's also a theater in um, in Manchester uh, that just have a completely different model. There's a bar where you can pick up girls, you can eat food <laughs> in the yeah. theater, yeah. you can move your chairs around, you can come up close, you can get up, you can walk out, you can text okay. uh, all right. during so, the so show. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I'm talking but, about. But, the theater as we yeah, know it yeah. now, it, it, you know, when people are in their 20s, and uh, I'm not in my 20s, so I've lost all this stuff, <laughs> you know, you're a, you have all this energy. So when you're coming into a theater, we're asking you to sit in a dark room Sit alone, don't touch anyone around you, <laughs> pay attention, pay attention, don't talk, it, pretend that you don't actually exist as a human being and focus. Don't talk over each other o over or interrupt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> focus, focus directly on one thing that's happening on stage. It's almost the complete opposite of, and the club experience is very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the complete opposite of that. Yeah, it's but that you interact, right? That's yeah. But we have, we have, we have one of those in Toronto. It's called Buddies in Bad Times Theater. Ha! <laughs> you know, you go to the club and it's packed. And you know? I, I propose to you that, uh, that there's another reason why you go to the theater. You go to the theater because the theater is answering a question that you want answered. And the theater is a way of, of exploring that question. And, and I think uh, in Berlin, there are lineups to go to the theater on the weekend, and it's all teenagers with their girlfriends going to the show. And uh, um, in Germany, there are tons, it's, it's just more pr promoted in a way that young people are gonna, f and the plant, the physical plant that they create, like Buddies, is more conducive to that. I mean, I think what you're saying is very funny, and 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 uh, but I think there are there is a demographic of young people who really are bored with the club scene, who think the club scene is like really hideous, and they'd love to go to have a different kind of environment, not the Royal Alex necessarily, but something like Buddies, more like Buddies. I actually I just I had a conversation with David Abel about Rocky Horror. the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which they did differently because. They did midnight shows, yeah, and they had beer. You could take beer into the theater and whatnot. And I think we've been talking about this a little bit different ideas about you know about that. But um, that's what we're doing next: the Rocky Horror Thompson Highway Dry Lips <laughs> Automotive to the Red Sisters <laughs> Dry Lips show Automotive to the nightclub. Bring your bannock. But <laughs> we were talking about it because I was calling the. I mean, not to be disparaging, but just to identify what we're doing, which is that we're changing. Some of us are changing the experience, and my, my question was, by, bring, by doing a midnight show, by bringing beer into the theater, by serving We're nachos, changing the rules. are you putting a prize in the Cracker Jack box that makes the prize not theater? So are we developing an audience that has other reasons to come to theater and then enjoys theater? Or are we developing an audience that will not come when you take those things away? This is not you know, a statement. I don't know right. the answer to this question. Okay, I see Sally has the mic and then Julie. Great, Catherine, because you said something really important, which is it takes time. And you have to spend time within a group of people in order to gain their trust, in order for them to want to even come see what you do. It's not, you know, oh, let's get the consultant in and, and target, uh, you know, that leader in the community and we send out our postcards or whatever. Uh, political leaders used to do this all the time too, you know, meet the group and rah, rah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and, and the big companies, what I would tell them is that these audiences are different. 
Um, and there are a number of things. I know that Yvette is probably also struggling with something that I was struggling for quite a while, which is dealing with a community that is not a theater going community and trying to get them into the theater in the first place. Um, and things like pay what you can, oh, you mean you can't come in 20 minutes late, um, all of these things are just like, what? You know? And it, for a long time, it took uh, someone would call to buy tickets, and for a while, they didn't want to talk to an answering machine and leave a message. They wanted to talk to a person and know they had a ticket there and that they could pick it up. That's changed now with internet and general, just a general change in all of our populations. Um, but I would spend an inordinate amount of time on the phone with each ticket buyer. And someone who was working with me goes, oh my God, why do you go like that? You know, it, can't they find you know, where the place is, on, whatever. And, it, but that's what we had to do. And now, you know, and, and our audiences do behave differently <coughs> sometimes. If anybody was in factory theater recently with uh, a drop of blood, you know, um, John Kaplan came and I had warned him that, you know, it would be kind of crowded for the pay what you can and stuff. And he just said, thank you. This is so much like European theaters. There's family here, there's all age groups, and people are wailing, they're <laughs> shouting, they're doing everything. And, and so, uh, no, I mean, what we do on stage isn't all that bad, but <laughs> if you're really rigid and institutional about how you approach people, if you want to bring people in, you do have to <laughs> meet them too and, and get to know them as well as um, what yeah. Thanks. While the microphone travels with Mike, I will, uh, I just want to throw in that I, th I think I'm dealing with another thing as an Aboriginal theatre company which is political with a small p and in Franco's case that's like a good thing but when it's attached to First Nations it's not necessarily a good thing because one of the things that we face at Native Earth all the time is, is oh, it's going to be victim theater. Oh, it's going to be whiny theater. Oh, it's going to, I'm, they're going to shake the finger at me, and, they, and we may, but that's not necessarily the work we're doing. Um, we actually wait to come here, <laughs> here to shake our fingers. One of the things we're trying to do at Native Earth is show the breadth of the work, contemporary Aboriginal practice, to anyone who will come. But what I think is what I think the perception of Aboriginal right now is is the Mohawk uh, stopping the Via Rail is the is the it's Oka Caledonia it's, it's Oka it's Caledonia it's we we can't find any coverage of us in the paper except negative and therefore that is uh, something that we are fighting in order to get audiences in to see our show the place between which is a dance theater piece which people just aren't interested in. It, it doesn't matter, like, you know, we talked about the critics and the notices, we had great notices, we had great coverage, we had great word of mouth, we had no audiences, so. Um, I think, sorry, it's, I also think it's important to make a, this may be going a bit backwards, but um, there's two ideas that, that, I've been, that I've been hearing that I wanted to make a distinction between, which is seeing ourselves on stage, um, not, does not mean not telling a universal story. Me seeing a black person on stage does not mean I'm watching a black story. It means I'm watching a play with a black person in it, um, which could be written by a white or a native or an Asian writer, and that I'm not unwilling to come to a play that doesn't have a black person on stage. But certainly, 10 in a row makes me feel like I'm in the wrong room. Um, and secondly, telling good or universal stories, as John touched on, that if no matter what the story you're telling is, is if it's a good story, it's a good story, and so one of the things we have to talk about is getting diverse audiences into diverse shows and knowing, um, knowing what is universal about a, sh a story that can appeal into various communities and that sort of thing, and which is something that we, are, that we try to do with Native Earth's work, which is to, like, every time you go see a black play, you don't think it's going to be about slavery because some people are writing about what happened after that. I mean, it's been 200 years. Every time you go see a Native play, it's not always going to be about you know, what, about land occupation. Every Asian play is not about bodies along the, the railroad or, you know. Um, our stories are, our stories are as diverse as ourselves. There is not a black story, a black play, or as you'd say, there are only five stories. And we all have them. 
And so that's something else for us to think about. As